Hey guys, this is my friend uh, Nathan Reynolds, and this has been a year in the making. Every single time we've ever tried to re record, get up with each other, something's always happened. It's always a story, right? Two or three, four hours ago, me and Nathan were talking, and we were talking about the things that are all around us, uh, weapons we can't see and all that kind of stuff. And, and this true nature of this world is beyond our imagination. But we got to talking about these these fibers and these these threads that are in us that are not supposed to be there, the synthetic biology. And then he started going off on the story talking about somebody in his family and these serpent mounds. And so this is where we're going to start this conversation at, these serpent mounds, see if there's a parallel there between what's going on and what he has seen and he has been involved in and been around his whole life with the synthetic biology. And so we'll just see where it goes. How's it going, Nathan? It's going awesome. How are you doing? Pretty good, bro. There you are. I couldn't be more excited. You're right. It's been a long time in the making, but it's going to be well worth it because we now have an opportunity to drive this thing. I mean, drive it to the to the light because that's the only way that we can ever get a, a true understanding of what is going on in darkness. You know, this stuff has no ability to to survive when it's brought to the light. You know, everything they do, they do in secret. You know, the master was sitting there as people are accusing him of all this stuff. And he's like, listen, everything I've done, I've done openly. It's you guys who operate behind the scenes. It's you, the shadow walkers who are doing this stuff. And I was sharing with Eric earlier um, about my family and how how some of the people in my family got initiated into this serpent cult because on, on think on one side of this people have this understanding of oh these people that are engaged in this you know human human sacrifice and child sacrifice child exploitation rings and like how do they actually get into this and a lot of them some of them stumble into it and it's not that they're necessarily the old religion carriers of this ancient secrets a lot of them stumble onto it because they started digging and what happened is i had a a one of my ancestors who was a, a gifted archaeologist for, and, and I mean, this is before a lot of the certifications in the universities and that kind of stuff. They used to train people in a very different form of archaeological understanding about this country. And I was telling him earlier about old world records here in the Americas. And this is one of the books that I would, I can't recommend enough. It's called In Plain Sight, and it's written by a woman named Gloria Farley, and uh, she was what they would call an amateur archaeologist who began to start to question the narrative about what is this land that we actually live in because she started examining the discoveries of these petroglyphs. She was trying to understand and decipher a lot of the ancient languages that they would find in hieroglyphics and petroglyphs uh, all across the Southwest, specifically Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, a lot of the desert landscapes in the Americas. And she started finding all of these petroglyphs and of that were in line with ancient Egypt, Phoenicians, Nordic, that she was discovering all over the Americas evidence of intercontinental trade systems and key components being the worship of these very beings and deities that are identified in the scriptures like Baal Peor, like, like Baal Zaphon, these specific Elohim, these other mighty ones that have been around from antiquity. And she's starting to find their effigies, their, their practices, their ceremonial incantations, their, the rites and passages that were used by the priest class, the guardians of these black flames. She started finding all of the evidence for this stuff and then started presenting this to her colleagues. And, you know, they ridiculed her and tried to totally stifle her, but her work lives on. And it's an incredible way of deciphering this because I've had this deep quest throughout my life to understand what is this plumed serpent that, has been perpetually trying to devour and destroy every area of my life and the lives of the people all around me. And I didn't understand where it came from. But when I was uh, right around nine, 10 years old in uh, fourth and fifth grade, my great grandfather, whose uh, name is Don Potter Reynolds, and he was a man who was the president of the American Society of Civil Engineering out in New York. And he was a, a really influential guy. And had the opportunity to to set the flame in the in the hand of the liberty. They took the old light uh, lighthouse over the Statue of Liberty, and they replaced it with a new flame. And it was this big ritual. And because he's a Luciferian, and so he was the one who was tasked with doing this. Anyways, he ended up coming down with a stroke, and so my family went back there um, to bring all of his stuff and bring him back. My my father wanted access to the trust fund that, that he had. And so he sold me to my great grandfather and I became basically a sex slave for all intents and purposes. But during the course of that, one of the things that came to the light was all of this stuff that they have stored in his basement. And a big component of that were these ancient records that they started discovering. It was his ancestor who was an archeologist that began to dig into a lot of the mounds in the Ohio river Valley, specifically in Ohio and another area uh, in central Michigan and lower Michigan where they started finding these serpent mounds. 
And it's not that they were necessarily the people that found him, but he found a particular one that opened up uh, into a chamber where they found these ancient texts and they didn't necessarily know how to decipher them, but somebody was able to decipher them and they figured out that it was this priest class and it was a burial chamber that had a lot of their relics that were contained inside this. And in those books was these old religions, the ways of awakening the plume serpent, the name America, America comes from the word for the land of the plumed serpent. This is what this land has been called for thousands of years, predating Vespucci and these Italian map makers who they say they gave this credit for, for the guy's first name, but it's not. People have been calling it that land for a long time because that is what was the mighty one, the deity that ruled and reigned over this territory for thousands of years. And that, that, that cult, the way that they got in contact, basically a lot of these rites and rituals, you guys, that they get kind of occulted, meaning they just get concealed or they made secret. What they're actually bringing forth during this, what is the, the, the man behind the curtain is a way to dial the phone book to the watchers, to these, these Gregories, these, these fallen ones who have been bound in chains of darkness, waiting until there's either a, a release or they are sent free to go and wage their final campaign against, against the Mosai and against his, the sons of Elohim. And so they had this, 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 these books that gave them the ability to start doing these rites and rituals to start making contact with them and started opening portals through child sacrifice predominantly is one of the main things they demand blood. This is what there's a, one of the best books you guys can read, which is called the discovery and conquest of Mexico. And it was written by a man named, um, uh, del castillo uh bernal del castillo and he was the first hand um witness of hernando de cortez conquest of central and south america predominantly mexico mexico and it details what they found when they started coming over here and one of the main overarching themes is the details of this specific quetzalcoatl which was the name of this deity their mighty one at the time this plume serpent and what their rites of passages were when they come into these temples and they were finding human beings carved to pieces the priest class used to live inside these temples covered in dreadlocks that were made their dreadlocks were, were this blood and, and human tissue organ systems that they would rub into their hair and they never washed themselves though so they were like the walking dead this kind of zombified class and this was the priest class and so the entire societal structure of south of central america was based off of being able to bring in human material hum, like literal human material as a means to feed this deity and this priest class system which was cannibalistic they carved up and had butchered stations where people were eating and selling each other wholesale like a like a regular market meat market was cannibalism and so they paint a very graphic picture of what this looked like until they actually get to mexico city and they see the capital of this and where they're slaughtering tens of thousands of people on a daily basis sometimes physically carving them out taking their hearts out while they're beating drinking them consuming of the blood this, this vampiric demand of bloodshed because these beings, you guys, these, these uh, other mighty ones, they're not flesh and blood. They're flesh and bone. They're a different nature in and of themselves, which allows them to pass through fire, allows them to pass through water, allows them to pass through material objects like we do have this uh, inability to go through, but they, they can transmute themselves. They can alter themselves to be uh, transformers for all better lack of a better words. And so my family started taking this knowledge and using that to try to get what was called foretelling. They wanted, they wanted to know the future. And when you make covenants with this X class of, of mighty ones, what they do is they offer you a glimpse of the future. And the, this kind of goes back to the way that the dragon was contending with Yeshua when he was fasting. It said that he took him up on a great high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth in a moment of time. So he showed him time. He showed him that he was the timekeeper, right? A, a guardian of the time. And he was able to show him the future. And he said, if you'll just bow down and worship me, right? You, all you have to do is bow down and worship me and I will give all of this to you, right? And Yeshua rebuked him with the words, the sword of his mouth from Deuteronomy, right? You shall worship Yahuwah him and him only shall you serve, right? Exodus 20, this is like preeminent fundamentals of warfare here. He rebuked him with the commandments. He understood that there was a greater cov there was a greater covenant. He appealed to the highest authority. Well, the dragon has this ability. These serpents have this ability to show you the future. Now they're only going to give you a glimpse through that kind of all seeing eye, that, that eye of Horus, that they're going to show you a glimpse of the future. And so what they showed my ancestors was what aluminum and tobacco predominantly were going to be in the future. And they, they showed them some of the methodologies for getting bauxite and, and being able to process dirt for all better terms and turn it into these heavy metals, turn it into these toxic compounds. But the cost for doing that is always bloodshed. 
And so they utilized a, a tool for this ritual working when they got this piece of information that was called the, the Judas coin, which was a piece of silver. That was one of the 30 pieces of silver. They call them Tyrian shekels that J Judas was given as payment, blood money for the, the, the Messiah's betrayal. And so that money after his death, if you remember, Judas came back to the Pharisees and he threw the money at the feet of the assembly there and said, I, I, I don't want this anymore. Right. And they said, well, it's blood money because literally we, we can't we can't use it for the temple. So let's go buy a field with it. And so they bought a field and they buried people in it. And those coins became these sigils, these um, these ritual objects for lack of a better word that were used in these rituals and people would take these and they would touch them to two objects, touch them to gold and whatever they touch them to would manifest and, and build an empire for them. They would call it raising the Titan. And it, it was this Titan, these mighty ones. And there was 30 specific pieces and there were 30 principalities that were the governors over those 30 pieces. And so a lot of these people that, that people or a lot of these families that people say, you know, oh, they're the rulers, they're the elite and all the rest of it. The majority of these people, if you really dig into the coffers of what it is in, inside their closets, they have some of these specific charged objects, whether it's the Spear of Destiny that's in Hamburg, Germany, or whether that is the you know pieces of relics from the, the cross. That's the spear, by the way, that pierced the side of the Messiah and blood and water came out of it. Or it's these Judas coins. People have these and they use these to do these rituals. Well, when they did that, what happened is that those brothers, um, a vaccine of for better words, at the time was being put forward and it killed a bunch of their brothers and sisters, their family members. So every time you start to make these deals, bloodshed is what's required. So anytime these empires get built, there's a massive cost on the other side of it of human expenditures, and which is what we've seen these empires that have done is they built their empires on blood. My family chose the third route. They weren't, they didn't chose the uh, overt white gold side of this, the, the uh, business side of this. They chose the blackmail and the corruption side of it, that they were going to be the people that trafficked secrets. Secrets was the currency of compromise that they chose to traffic in. And the cost of that was one generation. Everybody has to pass over one of their children through the fires of Moloch, through the fires of, of transhumanism, uh, alteration into the image of the beast to try to raise up one of the progenitors of the beast system. And so this serpent cult got obsessed with this and they moved their base of operations during the, the time of my father's time. And uh, they, they set up operations in Southern California and then ultimately in Lake Havasu City, Arizona at a place called the London Bridge. And this is where they were trying to summon and resurrect and bring out of their of his chains the great red dragon. They wanted to be able to have access to the, the the devil. They wanted to be able to speak with him and meet with him. And so a lot of the rituals that were done there, a lot of the the abuse and everything was trying to draw these ancient ones up from their places in Tartarus, their places in in the inner sanctums of the earth so that they would come out and give them this foretelling. So there'd be men that would be participants in this. They would bring forward one of their sons. Each of them would have one of their chosen ones for that generation who would be made to go through these rituals, be abused, be tortured, or sometimes sacrificed. And then the drawing up from the depths would bring these entities, would bring these horrible creatures who would come out and impart this their prophecies, for lack of a better word. And these are the guys who became some of these players in positions of power and authority that have been running the society around them. So hopefully that gives you a little better idea of some of the physical side of it. Eric and I were talking earlier though, about some of the, just the particulate side of it, the physical synthetic biology, because during these rites and rituals, there's this black fluid that these people were consuming, or when one of these entities would come forward and, and blood let out of himself, it would be this black goo that people were drinking or that we were made to drink. And it would alter people. They would, it was like a fountain of youth. People's bodies would be transformed in front of your face. They would change shape. They would they would uh, no longer look old. They wouldn't look aged. They would have an intellect that would be restored to them. It was a possession of a sense, but it was different because it was a it was a biological change, a, a true transformation that took place in their physiology. And it it forever seared in my conscience that there is this other fluid. We called it black goo or programmable matter that there was a synthetic version that I was seeing counterfeited in the United States military, but there was this old religion version that came from drinking the blood of these serpents, drinking the blood of these dragons and these, these serpentine people and uh, these hybrids. And this is what I believe much of what Eric and, and others are starting to uncover and unpack is that this form of biology really is the seed of the serpent that's infesting itself and trying to alter the world in its image. That's right.
100%. And uh, as I was telling Nathan earlier, when I first started working with this uh, synthetic biology, and I started utilizing one of these devices, when you actually see serpents swim out of people's tissues everywhere, you know, in that moment, especially with my faith and my understanding of the scriptures, you know, you know, who you know, who's behind it, you know, what system this is, you know, who it's from, you know, what it's about. Well, at least I do. And I I believe I do. I mean, because again, I I said this all the time and I will continue to say this, our enemy, the, the, the prince of this world. So if there's a prince of this world, there's a kingdom in this world. If there's a kingdom in this world, there's a major organization in this world. And people have to stop looking at fleshly people like Nathan and myself or other people who work in different offices throughout the, our, our states and our uh, countries that they're not in, they're not in charge. They're not in control. There's, there's no man, physical man in charge of this world. There are deities that because your, your church wanted to teach you about prosperity you wanted to teach you about the love and kindness of everything and evil doesn't exist because our messiah paid the price but again our messiah told us before he left he said i won't speak with you much anymore for the prince of this world or sometimes the translation goes for the ruler of this world comes and i'm not in him so or he's not in me he has nothing in me he has nothing so Mm -hmm. sounds like to me that he told you (laughs) Uh, to beware if if i'm not mistaken the majority of his ministry was driving out demons and warning you about these days and then we have to understand that when i read science and i look at science and i see this language that reminds me of things that i see in scripture like we were talking about hallel Mm -hmm. immortalized hallel cells and of course, uh, there's a story. Will behind, you just right? tell us, you got to tell us a little bit about that because that blew my mind. But Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, they replaced Hallel with Lucifer, you know, a fairly new word. And so this being is an Elohim. He's a mighty one. And again, if you don't understand Psalms 82, understand that the father's That's talking to the father's talking to the so-called gods of this world. And he's telling you how horrific of rulers they are. They're they're vicious people, right? Yeah. He's going, he, but he tells you in Psalms 82, one of the most important Psalms you can read is so you understand who's in charge of this place and stop thinking, you know, well, our father, he wouldn't allow this to happen. No, he told you it's happening. He told you and he warned you that th- these entities are in charge and they're, and, you know, you have to make choices. And you have to stand strong. But anyway, so we get to Hillel. And so there's a story that this Hillel cell, you know, that some some uh, impoverished um, black lady in the South is this Henrietta Lacks or something of that. Name. But that's not that's not what it's about, because you don't understand. There's a story behind everything. There's a there's the narrative and there's what's really going on. So when they're telling you that, that they're injecting you with mortalized cells, they're not lying. They're injecting you with immortal cells from Hillel. That's my perspective on it because I'm looking at this this literature, this so-called scientific literature, white papers and all that stuff. And it's littered with all the stuff, all these mighty ones. So there's mighty ones all through science, but people lack faith. They have no faith. They, They don't believe in anything. None of this matters. But again, it doesn't matter what you believe. It does not matter what you believe because these psychopaths that are that 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 worship these mighty ones, they yeah. believe in something, but it ain't right. what you believe. So yeah, that that's that's what's going on. We're we're, we're being in, in violated with this threat that's not supposed to be in this 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 uh, abominable weaving of things. And I think you this inter the intermingling right. Yeshua gives these warnings about in the end days, right? These, he gives these symptomatic lists of like things to be aware of. Hey, Bolo, he puts out a Bolo, be on the lookout for, right? This is some of the fruit of what you will know the days and the hours of the times that you're living in. And he gives this, this reference. He's like, as it was in the days of Noah, 
But if you grow up ignorant, like I, many people grew up totally beguiled and ignorant as to what the days of Noah were really about. Right. I remember going to the, uh, the, the Christian churches and they had the felt boards, you know, they had these little green boards with felt on it and they would have little character cutouts and they'd put them on there and they would talk about the stuff that happened in the story. They'd read the story and they would kind of do a little diagram or diorama. And they would talk about the days of Noah and it was always just like, oh yeah, violence, right? Bad guys being mean, stealing stuff, taking so stuff from other people, bad guys. just bad stuff, right? And you're like, oh, okay, all right, bad stuff, you know? And then you're like, what is this Genesis 6 passage talking about the sons of Elohim, B'nai Ha Elohim, these, these sons of Elohim? And you're right, if you don't read Psalm 82, you don't know about the divine council, you don't know about, there is a hierarchical structure to the, 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 the most high's throne room that he literally has counselors. That he's got thrones and principalities and powers and rulers. There's these these archons. There are these ruling powers, these principalities, which is like one rank. Okay, I come from a military background. I went from this this filthy Jesuit order and being part of this this teams of assassins, and I got put into the military projects, and I learned all about chains of command, chains of command. My whole stinking life was in that. My life was infested with this chain of command. And so, but at, on one side of it is very important piece of governing structure. You need to have some form of dealing with how to manage people. You know, even Moses got rebuked by Jethro, his father-in-law, because he lacked the ability to filter through all of the things that were coming his way. And it was wearing him out. And this is the main preeminent thing. The main tactic of our end adversary is the Fabian attack, which is a war of attrition. You wear out the saints, wear out the set apart ones, the called out ones. He goes to make with great wrath. He goes to make war with those who guard the commandments of Yahuwah and keep the testimonies of Yahshua. Like he goes to make that war with them. And it literally is going to require the intervention from the very same earth that has been corrupted, that is crying out. Like the earth has been opening its mouth to swallow up this blood since Abel. And it said that that blood, the, the physical blood we're talking about, cries out day and night. Like that is something completely different than what we're told that when a guy dies and his blood spills on the ground, right? It's over. We just bury it with some dirt and you move on. And you, we don't think about the blood as a perpetual witness, but it literally says in the end of days during this great unleashing of the, 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 the tactics and the schemes and the plans and the strategies of these immortals. Think about this. The very B'nai Ha Elohim, the very same watchers who descended on Mount Hermon, and they took wives of their, that they desired. They took women. They raped. They beguiled women and made them. They're conduits. They made the first classes of witches on the earth. A witch is someone who, a woman who has a familiar spirit, just so we're clear. A wizard would be a male who has a familiar spirit. The woman that, that Saul met at Endor, she was a witch because she had this familiar spirit. And so when she conjured Samuel, when he actually came forward, instead of the familiar spirit that she normally did this necromancy and did these uh, conjurings with, that's why she was so terrified. Because she literally, one of the descent, one of the people who died was there witnessing and prophesying against it. Saul never saw Samuel again from the days when he was supposed to kill and blot out the Amalekites until the day of his death. That was the only time he ever saw him again. He hadn't seen him again. And when these people engage in this necromancy, they start to resurrect and try to bring back these fallen ones. They're trying to bring back the days of Noah. They're trying to alter the world into their image. The whole world became corrupted, perverted. And that literally that word perversion is a twisting. Like it's like, it's a twisting. Like people talk about our DNA and what it looks like and all this other stuff. It's an, it's a distractionary side it's a rabbit trail to get people missing the point of understanding that there is an intermingling process like daniel warned us about this mixing between two kingdoms a physical kingdom of clay and another kingdom of metal and it is this other meta materials that are being brought in another strand like what has happened in jude one jude one gives a great breakdown of this can i just read this real quick yeah, man. jude one just stinging rocks bro we can just read a book of the bible real quick how many of you have sharpened your sword recently if you don't know about sharpening Jude is the deal. Jude is the deal. Jude is, Jude, like, is, Jude, like, Jude and second Peter, 
Jude and Second Peter are those like just absolutely cutting the throat of the kingdom of corruption and so much of like what the heck is he talking about here? Like what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? Because if you read if you read the account, if you start to go back to, to Genesis and you start to understand like how did the adversary prepare an invaded army? He like the adversary knew about these prophecies, right? He's known about the seed war all the way back to Genesis three. When you go all the way back to where did the dragon first, the serpent first got entered into the devil entered into the serpent, this great fiery serpent, this, this Quetzalcoatl, right? The great plume serpent who stood in this tree of knowledge of good and evil and enticed, seduced Eve predominantly first through the greatest vulnerability that the woman had, which was her eyes through the lust of the eyes. She saw the fruit was pleasing to the, pleasing to the sight, right? This is why still to this day, they utilize industrial psychologists to engineer things through the eyes to get people to make decisions that are not necessarily in their better interests. This is the whole role of propaganda. This is the whole role of the industrial psychologists. And it's just constant warfare. Why I'm always about the book propaganda by Edward Bernays, which details a lot of this anyways. Back in the garden, the serpent got the curse laid on him. He lost his ability to speak. He crawls around, and what does he eat? What is his food source? What does it say, Eric, that he eats? Dust. Dirt. Dust. And what are we made from? Dirt. Dust. Bro, Clay. He, he, he cannot survive without the consumption of mankind. He literally has to eat us in order to sustain himself. They need humans they need humans and human this is where the whole mentality this is where the whole doctrine of demons that you need to consume humans physically consume other people's life essences their blood in order to live this is the whole the ancient the ancient preservation of the ideologies of vampirism right that goes back to sodom and gomorrah there was this great flood the great cataclysm the great immersion of the entire earth to try to eradicate this this other image of what had been altered all of all of the women were taught what were called the secrets of heaven right if you go to first uh we'll go to first enoch 10 here in a little bit allow remind me to circle back to that because it gives you a list of what they taught them and it shows you where a lot of these secrets were brought in anyways they began to start to use this information to bring about this alteration campaign of the entire earth, the entire earth became only evil continually. I mean, how do you do that? You have to have mass mind control. You have to have a complete takeover of every single species of plant, every single species of animal, insect, everything on the face of the earth had to have been altered. And how do you, how do you do that? How do you engineer how do you engineer a takeover like that? Now, at the time, we know that these watchers were loose. They were open. We had hybridization. There was overt. It wasn't occulted, right? This entire campaign and the war that was waged back then was not, was not covert. Noah was this preacher of righteousness for 120 years to the hybrids. This is a book that um, it's out of print now, but it was written by a guy named John Darnell, and it's called The Gospel to Every Creature. And it's this is based off of Mark where Yeshua told everyone – the great commission that we talk about, right? What is our actual mission from the captain of the heavenly host? What is our driving mission statement here? And he said, go therefore unto all the nations, the word there is cosmos, all the world, every every corner of, of creation and preach the gospel, the good news, the besorah to every creature. And it literally uses the word creature. It doesn't say mankind. He's specific about it. And this one, his subtitle is good news for Nephilim, transhumans, enhanced humans and anyone else who is the result of genetic experimentation the only way to view someone who is not 100 percent genetically human is to see a human being whose genetics have been modified then you can tap into elohim's heart for redemption john darnell wrote this book nice. and it was incredibly helpful for me because you guys i i it, it sounds strange to people that don't get raised up in these societies that don't that don't get impregnated with these doctrines so early on. But like, I really struggled with whether or not I ever had the potential to be saved, to have it, have an opportunity to enter in through the narrow gate, because I was totally convinced that I was a, a child, a progenitor of this bloodline of the serpent, that I was a, a bloodline carrier of the seed of the serpent. And because of that, I was cut off. I was anathema. I was a curse that I, I had no ability to ever enter in, that I could not be redeemed, right? I was, I was forever accursed, and there was nothing I could do about it. And this, this was some of the stuff that really helped me to get to a place of understanding that 
The father has a unique and powerful way of bringing deliverance. And Noah for 120 years, all the way to the very end, was preaching the hybrids. He, he was right. preaching mercy and deliverance and restoration from genetic alteration, from human experimentation campaigns. Like he was preaching to these abominations. People are just going to call them abominations. But you got to understand, David himself, even his gibberine, the mighty man of valor, he had in and amidst his army commanders over his army, men, two mighty men of Moab. They're called lion faced men of Moab. You can look it up. I'll show some pictures of it. People who have had found skulls of these guys who literally have lion heads. They're physically lions on their upper body, and yet they're men. And it said they could outrun a gazelle, that one of them was greater than a thousand people. And David immediately made them commanders. Benaiah, one of his who later became David's uh, head of his bodyguard and later the commander of uh, Solomon's entire army of Israel. Benaiah was credited with one of the great attributes that he said when he was, you know, being heralded for slaughtering a giant. He killed an Egyptian giant. It says he walked up to him with nothing but a staff in his hand and he went up to the Egyptian and took the staff, took the spear out of his own hand and killed him with it, which is super savage. It said he climbed into a pit with a lion on a snowy day and he slaughtered it, right? Now, Lions back then, in, in our mindset, we think, you know, African lion, big thing. The largest lions that ever existed were here in the Americas, and they were 10 footers, massive things that weighed 700 to 1,000 pounds, unbelievably massive things. So to climb into a pit with one of these things and tear it up is unbelievable, unbelievable. But it said of all of those traits, he said he also killed one of the mighty, the lion faced men of Moab. And these were these superhumans, right? These super, these, these hybrids, they were still around. And so the question you have to start to wrestle with is if Yahuwah wiped it out, it said he took out everything that had the breath of life in it. So then where do these hybrids come from? Where do these genetic alterations, these, where do these creatures come from? Where's the second incursion, right? The big question people wrestle with was it, was it the genetics that were carried onto the ark through ham or his wife or somebody like, where did it come from? Was it ham having sex with his mother, Noah's wife, when he was drunk and passed out in the tent, was that's why he cursed his son? Why did he curse ham? You know, like, why did, why did he curse his grandson? You know, why did he do that if it's not because he uncovered his father's nakedness, which is a direct reference throughout the Torah to a man having sex with one of his relatives? You know, is it that is that where the alteration took place? I really believe that you have more scriptural evidence to find that it took place at Sodom and Gomorrah. And the adversary knew that these prophecies were that there was there was a certain requirement before the people could go in to the promised land, to the lands of Canaan, right? And the 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 promise that was given to Abraham is that the iniquity of the Amorites had to be full. There was a cup, literally, there was a cup that was needing to be filled up. And until that cup was full of iniquity. Okay, there's three basic breakdowns here. You have sin, which is transgression of the law. First John tells us that the only actual biblical definition of sin is transgression of the Torah. Okay, continued, repeated, ongoing sin, right, is called transgression, where you're continuing to break that sin and continue to act in rebellion. The third, the third version of that is called iniquity, which is absolutely like the searing of your conscience. You've completely given yourself over to it. The right. sins of your iniquities, this is the stuff that alters you. You changes your image. You physically are altered to become something else, and that can be passed on to your third or fourth generation. Okay, that's, that, that's a very important component of this. It says a wickedness, right? You fail to do these things. It says in these 10 words over here that these sins and these iniquities will be passed on to the third and fourth generation. However, the blessings can be passed on to a thousand generations, right? So, so walking in obedience, walking in righteousness, walking in humility and meekness and boldness and truth and convictions in the fruits of the flesh can bless you to a thousand generations, meaning it can heal you. It can heal your generations that your posterity that comes from you. And so when we want to identify how the enemy began to prepare the invasion war to stop the seed war, because it's always been about the seed war. It's been the whole battle ever since the beginning was there is going to become a man who is going to crush. That is going to be the seed of this woman. We go back to Genesis three. The seed of the woman is going to get wounded by the serpent. The serpent's going to bite his heel, pierce his heel, his foot. Think about this for a moment. He's going to strike his heel, but he is going to crush his head. He will crush his head. And this is what ended up taking place with the Messiah ultimately. However, this is a veil. This is a prophecy. It's a veil, uh, a glass darkly, looking through a glass darkly, trying to understand it. The adversary didn't understand this stuff. It said they would have never crucified these principalities and powers and rulers and archons would have never crucified the king of glory. They never would have crucified Yeshua. They would never would have impaled him if they had known what would take place. They would have never done it because it was their death sentence the day they did that. It literally said he went down into the depths of the earth and went and took captivity captive. 
He went and took the keys of death from the devil. Okay, death was conceived in the garden. It was conceived there at the moment of transgression. Death then was under the dominion. Adam should have always been able to hold the keys over death because death didn't get to reign over us. But as soon as that transgression took place, as soon as that sin took place, the devil got the keys to death. And this is the ultimate power source. This is the greatest, like, it's the gangster with the pit bull on the leash, right? It is, it is the, the devourer. It is the ravager. And so he had the ability to send that, send that death, send the prince of death out on others, on whoever he chose, right? This is why he was able to petition Yahuwah in the book of Job when he's like, where have you been? He's like roaming about inside the earth, going up and down in it. And he's like, have you considered my servant Job, right? A man who is blameless and righteous, upright man. Have you considered him? And he gave, Yahuwah gave him the ability to execute death against his children, against his fam against his livestock, against his servants, against so many people. He used his, his, ad his pimp for all and better. I mean, I don't mean to speak evil of any or revile these dignitaries. We're going to talk about that here in the book of Jude. He used him like a pimp uses his players out there in the field when he's stuck in prison for all intents and purposes. Okay. He uses death to execute his plans. And when you read how the adversary had to prepare a kingdom to fight against that inevitable sea war that was coming, to wage a war against it in the lands of Canaan, he had to raise up giants. He had to create a fortified structure. He had to build a kingdom of resistance fighters. He needed to have the greatest defensive force on the face of the earth to try to resist the sons of Abraham from coming in to conquer that territory, to utterly eradicate this place of evil. And so what was the sins? What was the iniquity of the Amorites? What was their sins that they were doing? What was taking place there? And if you go back to the book of Jude, it says, Yehuda, a servant of Yeshua Messiah and brother of Yaakov, to those who are called, set apart by the Elohim, the Father, preserved in Yeshua Messiah, compassion and peace and love be increased to you, beloved ones, making all haste to write to you concerning our common deliverance. I felt the necessity to write to you, urging you to earnestly contend for the belief, which was once for all delivered to the set apart ones. For certain men have slipped in whose judgment was written about long ago, wicked ones, perverting, there's that twisting, the favor of our Elohim for indecency, and denying the only master Yeshua and our master or our master Yahuwah and our master Yeshua Messiah. Body, I intend to remind you, though you once knew this, that Yahuwah, having saved a people out of the land of Mitzrayim, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the messengers who did not keep their own principality, their own estate, right? The transformers who rebelled, the ones who chose to fall. That's where we get these words, Nephilim, the fallen ones. Having, what's that? Decepticons. You got it, dude. Crushing it. But they left their own dwelling. He has kept in everlasting shackles under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar way to these. So now you're getting the clue. These were transformers here. We're talking about transformers again. Metaskitzmazatoy. That's the word here. Okay, the word in Greek here is about meta schizmazatoi. It says, marvel not, I think it's 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Marvel not for your adversary, the devil, masquerades, transforms himself as an angel of light. And his ministers, his apostles do likewise. That is what you're dealing with. Meta schizmazatoi is the Greek word for that. He's, it's, it's, it is literally a shape shifter. That is what you would call it, like skinwalkers. I got into a lot of the uh, Dene people stuff, and I was trying to learn how to how to fight back against these people. So I got initiated into the stuff with the Apache and the and the Navajo on this reservation out there outside of Sholo Lakeside uh, in Pine Top, Arizona. My family moved right next to the reservation out there, and they started doing a lot of these occult workings with this different cult that had a lot of Mormonism and a lot of other just. It was strange doctrines. I'll just tell you that much. It was different than the stuff that's going on in Lake Havasu and in Phoenix. But these people, um, when I was in there, they started initiating me into be what's part of what you would call skinwalker shamanism and trying to, trying to learn as part of a, a trade of becoming an assassin. I wanted to learn how to be silent. I wanted to be able to be undetectable. And they were the people that you're supposed to go to, that you could learn how to walk without leaving footprints, that you could learn how to walk on, on leaves and, and dry brush without making any sounds. I wanted to learn how to walk between realms is what it was called. And so- the way that you do that, the way that skinwalkers and these people that that start to to mix themselves and be able to to 
shapeshift themselves into other creatures and other beings and stuff like that was you had to kill one of your own bloodline family relatives. You generally had to strangle them to death either with a garrote, which is a strangulation wire, or you had to use your bare hands. And uh, you weren't allowed to generally, sp- you, it almost always required that you did not spill their blood. It was all about suffocation. And it was all about breathing in their nefesh, their, their life as their life was passing forward. And so you go through this stuff to kill somebody who you loved. Uh, I didn't have bloodline family members in the same way. And so another person was brought in as a substitute. And this is filthy stuff I had to talk about. And uh, I went back to that site back um, in uh, just before I published the book, Tom Dunn, uh, a guy who uh, he's, he's got a, a ministry called Through the Black, and he worked really hard with Russ Dizar, author of this book, uh, The Black Awakening, Rise of the Satanic Super Soldiers. If you guys can get it, this book's like $2,000 now, and they, they killed him and his wife off back in 2021, a week in the same week that they killed Rob Skiba, they killed this guy. And uh, anyways, I was working with this guy, Tom Dunn, um, who was bringing forth a lot of this information. And him and I went and flew down to Arizona to film a lot of these sites and these places before I published my book because I knew they were going to destroy a lot of this stuff after I came forward. And uh, we went back to this spot where this ritual took place and where this killing took place. And uh, it was – on one side, you're so caught up in this uh, – this this like desire to to be to be the to be the hand of vengeance you, you're 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 caught with this concept that you can stop it and like you believe it like because if you can if you if you in one of these in one of these situations anybody who's ever been in a situation where they're being sexually abused or just being trapped that feeling of trapped right not maybe just not maybe you but somebody you love like you're actually having to live in a situation where there's ongoing perpetual systemic sexual abuse happening in your house, like to your family member. And you watch this every night. You watch the predator come in, licking his lips and salivating over and devouring you and devouring you and devouring you and consuming you. And then they turn and they're threatening that they're going to go after your sibling, that they're going to start doing this to your sibling. And you're like, no, 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 no. Just, yeah, I can take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Please just don't go over there. Please just go over there. Let them live. Let them live. I'll take it all. I'll be the defiled one. I'll be the abominated one. I'll be the one that's ruined, right? I just, just let me be the ruined one. And just, you sit there and you bear this stuff up over and over and over again. And you plot and you plan some way to get even. You want somebody to give you the keys to the collar that they've locked you up with your whole life and let you loose. Like the, the way that my family broke me was to make me like a pit bull that you just starve. You leave in the cage all the time and you just starve them until they're ravaging, ravaging with hunger. And they're just desperate to get off the leash to tear something's throat out. And this is what I got caught up in. And it just got, I got so brought into this, this death cult you know, I wanted to do all of the killing every time. I wanted to be the one who carried all the bloodshed. I wanted to be filled with the bloodshed so that when I got loosed, I could finally devour these people. And it led me to be willing to to, to kill somebody I cared about, to kill, to kill a child as a child and not to become the monster. Like you, you, I, I, I embraced the darkness to try to fight the darkness and it was so perverse and it was so it's the, the lesser of two evils, these false dilemmas that they set people up with that the, that it's, that it's better to choose the lesser of two evils. The better thing is to abstain. I'll tell you that much because what entered into me there, what took place there was, was this other thing, this other ideology this other darkness this into it this supernatural intelligence that 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 made me its bodysuit on this earth i lost myself in there and i used to go and sit on the top of this rock they had this these outcroppings of rocks there and i used to sit there with my dog and carve my name into this stone and i would always write my name n-a-t-e i didn't go by nathan for a lot of that time, I stopped smiling for a lot of years of my life. I stopped showing my teeth because I had large canines and I was embarrassed and I was ashamed of what was happening all the time. And, uh, and I used to carve my name N A T E. And I always wrote my T upside down when it was this other side of me that was suffering with all this stuff. And Tom and I went back to that site and filmed that rock. And we filmed three body mounts that were sitting right there that are still there to this day. And to sit there and look at these places, to go back to the high places and to sit there. And I, I went back with this desire, you guys. It says in the Torah that 
that if you want freedom from this stuff, that you says that the the only way that you can cleanse the earth of the bloodshed when you're the murderer is to have the murderer's blood be spilled in its place. And so I believed I had the the need to go back there and repent. I couldn't. I didn't go and cut myself and bleed all over everything. I went and I I, I begged for mercy to the earth and to the heavens as witnesses, like to 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 have some kind of cleansing take place in a supernatural realm that I'm not allowed to be in anymore that I'm banished from because I, I chose to forsake that kingdom. And I chose to, to believe the word was true and was unbreakable in my life. And that meant I had to stop the bloodshed because you can't, you can't cure it with more of their blood. It doesn't work like that. You said it so right, Eric, when you said that it's not, it's not these people we're physically fighting. We're not wrestling with flesh and blood, you guys. It says the, the, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not, they're not. They're not this anymore. Like, this is not how to fight the war. This is not the way you win. You win with the sword of your lips, and and the sword of your lip, the most powerful weapon we have is repentance. It's it's turning. It's turning. It's 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 choosing to no longer be the sovereign. It's choosing to not let any man rule over you. It's choosing to not let any other principality or power or ruler to rule over you. It's choosing to surrender to the fear of Yahuwah Elohim. Like it's choosing to forgive yourself. It's choosing as an act of my will. Like I literally pray as an act of my will, I choose to forgive these people who have harmed me. I choose to forgive them. I don't want to. I want them to be held liable. I want them to be held accountable. I want to see these victims vindicated. I want to see them suffer. But let me tell you, when you sit there and you peel the skin off of a pedophile and you sit there with a phone, a skin crafting tool, and you just peel their entire skin off their body, in front of them and you just pack their body with salt and you torture them in, in the most unimaginably malice is the word creating ways of causing harm to others inventing ways of evil to somebody else like when you you've been plotting your revenge for years like these immortals you guys have been plotting their revenge for years and then generations and then eons and then millennia and now they have the opportunity to enact their will. And this is what took place back in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. They got, they had to sit there. Part of the judgment Yahuwah Elohim rendered through the mouth of Enoch. When they asked for repentance, Yahuwah said, no repentance is going to be given unto you. He said, instead, go to the watchers and you tell them that they are going to sit there and they're going to watch their sons, their children. They're going to watch them kill each other. And then you're going to get put in prison. It's the same punishment that the king of Israel got, by the way. They watched his sons be murdered in front of his eyes. The son, uh, the king of Judah, sorry. They watched his sons be put to death in front of his eyes. Then they gouged out his eyes. Okay, He went around. The last thing he ever saw was the de absolute destruction of his children in front of his face. It's a, it's a horrible thing. It's an inutterable agony. It's a horrible sentence that was issued out. But from that place in that position, they knew they could not repent. Mankind can repent. But those that have been in the in the heavenly realms like this, these these other beings, the Ophanim, the Cherubim, these messengers, they don't get the right to repent. They know better, and they're without excuse. And so they have to plot revenge in a different way. And Sodom and Gomorrah was their intrusion of that. And it says here in verse 7 of Jude, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar way to these, having given themselves over to whoring and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, undergoing judicial punishment of everlasting fire. In the same way, indeed, these dreamers defile the flesh and reject authority and speak evil of esteemed ones. But Mikael, the chief messenger, in contending, contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moshe, presumed not to bring against him a blasphemous accusation, but said, Yahuwah rebuke you. But these blaspheme that which they do not know and that which they know naturally like unreasoning beasts. In these, they corrupt themselves. Woe to them because they have gone in the way of Cain and gave themselves to the delusion of Balaam for a reward and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are rocky reefs in your love feasts, feasting with you, feeding themselves without fear. 
waterless clouds borne about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, wild waves of the sea foaming up their own shame, straying stars for whom blackness of darkness is kept forever. And Hanok, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, also prophesied of these, saying, See, Yahuwah comes with myriads of his set-apart ones to execute judgment on all to punish all who are wicked among them concerning all their wicked works, which they have committed in a wicked way and concerning all the harsh words, which wicked sinners have spoken against him. These grumblers and complainers who walk according to their own lusts and their mouth speaks proudly, admiring faces of others for the sake of gain. But you beloved ones, remember the words spoken before by the emissaries of our master, Yeshua Messiah, because they told you that there would be mockers in the last times who would walk according to their own wicked lusts. They are the ones who cause divisions, not having the Ruach, the spirit, but you beloved ones, building yourselves up on your most set apart belief, praying in the set apart spirit, keep guard yourselves in the love of Elohim, looking for the compassion of our master, Yeshua Messiah, unto everlasting life, and show compassion towards those who are doubting, but others save with fear, snatching them from the flames, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. And to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his esteem with exceeding joy, to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, be esteem and greatness and might and authority both now and forever. Amen. That is why everything about my life is about being snatched from the flames. Because you know what? Some people needed to help me. They needed to instill in me a different kind of fear. I needed the fear of Yahuwah. And I needed the fear of him because I had so much fear of these other beings I have seen how powerful they are. I have seen how they have swayed the nations to do abominations. I've seen how they beguiled mankind. The wisest and sharpest and best people on the earth have been corrupted and led astray. They've compromised. Like we are so arrogant to think we can't get beguiled by an enemy who beguiled Adam and Eve, our father, the father of mankind was beguiled in a moment. How do we think we would not be deceived? He says, be not ignorant of the devil's schemes. Be not ignorant of them. But we're dying because we're perishing because of lack of knowledge. We're perishing because we don't understand our adversary. It said, for this reason, the son of Elohim was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Like, this is our war. And he says, how do we defeat the dragon? Our adversary, the devil, that serpent of old, Revelation 12, 11 tells us exactly how to do it. The enemy, the dragon, is defeated by the blood of the lamb, the words of our testimony, and not loving our lives when faced with death. That's how we conquer him. That's how we defeat him. I went around to those sites, and I begged Yahuwah to have mercy. I asked him to apply the blood of the lamb to a place in time that I no longer was in, but I asked that he would instead pour out the blood of the Messiah, the most powerful weapon that we have ever been given because it's true innocence, true purity, true faultlessness, without sin, without transgression, without iniquity. There is no fault in it. And because of that, it is the superlative weapon. It is the trifecta of holy, holy, holy is Yahuwah Elohim Almighty who was and is and is to come. It is the perfective set apart nature of his son on this earth who gave his life as a ransom for many. He gave his life to the murderers. This is why Moses was chosen. Moses was a murderer. And yet Yahuwah extended unto him loving kindness and mercy. And because I received that mercy, I extended it to the people. I choose to try to continue to extend it to the people who did this. But it's some days it's a lot harder than others because I still see the marks on my flesh. I still can look down at my body and see where I was sliced apart. Like I used to sit there and mutilate myself. I used to cut myself and cut myself and cut myself trying to have some kind of physical mark on my body of the physical anguish inside. I felt day and night like I wanted some mark on me. I wanted the mark of Cain to be there. When I was born, I manifested this mark, you guys, that made me this, this son of Cain, okay? 
see, I had this purple mark that would come on my face when I was enraged or being agonized. I had this, my face would turn like purple on half of it. And they believed that was the mark of Cain. And this is why I became the chosen one for these people. And this is why they brought me into this filthy cult because they thought, oh, here's another son of Cain. And it's not, I don't, I don't know the mechanics of it. I don't understand a lot of it. You guys, I still, I still don't. I was blotted out from the true history of my life. Yahoo is the only one who really knows what the heck it is all about. But you know what? This is the ways of Cain. And the ways of Abel were the ones that I needed to learn. I learned the ways of Cain for way too long, y'all. And this is the ways of Abel. This is the ways of the, the pure one, the one who understood that Yahuwah was interested in our best. He wasn't interested in, in, a, in a secondary offering. He wanted our best. He wanted our everything. It's an all-in war that we're supposed to be waging. And when we start to do that, when we really do that, we get total freedom. This was my brother in faith, Nathan Reynolds. If the Father wills it, we will talk again. Prepare yourself. The house of the dragon is in full deceive, distract, and devastate mode. Prepare your heart, your mind, your body, and your soul. The days ahead will be unlike anything we've ever experienced. Look up, cry out, and seek the Father daily.